um, to, pre uh, to prepare them to be, you know, resilient and strong when they get to the university. And that is, um, that is what I am, I am focusing, uh, that is what I focus on in my practice. And you will see that, I hope, hopefully, through this presentation. All right, so the agenda for today. You have the, we'll speak about the context. Then we'll see how we bring Maslow, Bloom, along with Anderson and Prathwal and Vygotsky to the classroom. Then I will speak about the visible thinking routines. I'll give you some examples from teaching, some examples from assessment. I will show you how I use the visible thinking routines for student portfolios and then my concluding thoughts. And I will also use the visible thinking routines at the end to evaluate this webinar. All right, so I have a small little video here that I can play for you. Watch it and then just tell me what your thoughts are. Think of it in terms of uh, teaching and learning, it, learning math. See, teach, think of it in terms of learning math. Just a straight plummet to certain death. Horton, here's Horton. Oh, don't worry, citizens of Whoville. I'm light as a feather. <laughs> hmm. Okay. What are your thoughts in terms of learning math? Participants can write their thoughts in the chat box or unmute yourself. Or then you can just read them also, that's also fine. Uh, it seems difficult at first. Okay. Uh, uh, I request Susan and Blit to please read out the chat messages. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, to share my own answer, I think um, it feels easy at first. We get halfway there and it becomes difficult. But if we believe it, then maybe we can go through with it, I think. Yeah, okay. If you believe, maybe so. When he believed that he was light as a feather, he was able to cross that. But then he knew again he was going to fall. And something saved him. What was that? A support from the other side, maybe? the tree stumps there or something like that. And uh, that's where, that's the role that the teacher plays, you see. Uh, math is always, uh, is, can be quite intimidating. I would, uh, if I were to re recall my own experiences of learning math, I found that um, sometimes it was really difficult to learn math. But it was when, um, when I found that my teacher cared about me and um, knew wh where I was going, or provided something to hold me and protect me, I or scaffold me, which would be the right word in this case, I was able to do better in math. So I'm going to uh, get you to you know, participate in a small activity now. This is a question. Why do students fear math? And uh, I'm going to stop share for a moment and share with you in the chat um, a link, a poll everywhere link where you can put in your, your responses and then we can see what you what you think. Everybody knows why students fear math, but let's see what the, the participants today think about that. It's just taking some time. Is 
certificate goes there then attend panna vendi sir okay i put the i put the link in the chat you can uh, oh, and i will also share uh, share the screen again with the poll everywhere can you see the poll everywhere screen yes we can sir so put in your responses um, where is the link have you put it in the chat i put it in the chat ma'am the link is not hyperlinked yeah it's not clickable okay uh, can you see it now just go to polev.com and then just uh, sign in i mean just join you just have to put your name okay i got one response so students fear math because it's abstract can you see the word cloud forming it says here what i'm get what i'm gathering is that they fear that just the subject by itself so far okay so what you're saying over here is that um, it's difficult to understand math there's a lot of memor mem memorization involved uh, you know maybe sometimes the appropriate methods are not used it's confusing it's abstract all these things okay let's go to another question then all right let's go to the next question the next question is as you can see from the slide and i will i will activate it on poll everywhere again it is um, when do you remember enjoying math so until i activate that can you just please think about when do you remember enjoying math when did you when did you enjoy math okay you can i'm going to share the screen again and you can put in your responses i think some of them were not able to access and they put it on the chat to me the answers okay then we'll just discuss it from the chat when do you remember enjoying that yeah so uh, susan can you read out the answers from the chat can you see my slides just now yes you i can see so they have written here students find it difficult to understand and relate geometry i enjoyed as a student and when we know this concept and tricks to solve we enjoy then if there are hands on activities which makes math more interesting it is true we enjoy math whenever we solve the problem and see the beauty of math okay i enjoy yes. doing maths in college or when i started teaching till standard 11 when we understood the concept well i enjoyed it i could do few things hands on when the concept was properly understood 
when taught in a fun way, when connected to life, when concepts are clear, when I'm able to solve it, when I actually started doing it myself, when I could see how the formula was derived. Yeah. Yeah. So basically what I, what I gathered from that was that you, people started to enjoy math when they could find connections, when they could understand it conceptually or holistically rather than just understanding how to apply a formula, how to do a calculation, how to, you know, how to remember the steps of a theorem, something like that. And uh, that is, that, that I would, I, my thoughts would also resonate with that. It makes a difference. When I studied math by rote, I never enjoyed math. So that's where now as a teacher, like some people said, when they started teaching math, they started enjoying math. I would say I do would share that, uh, that um, opinion. So when I started teaching math, I started to ask myself, what is it that students don't like about math? What is it that they fear about math? And uh, having done most all of my education, so to speak in India, I have been part of the system where there's a lot of em emphasis on achievement, on on marks, on on you know the the, the competition and um, and the rote learning, and the drill and practice and all these kind of things. And that was that was how I learned math. But when I came here, I realized that um, there has to be something more to it. And so, drawing from my experience as a teacher educator, the learning that I had over the years, etc., I thought, why don't I bring Bloom? Uh, Maslow and Vygotsky into my classroom. Now, this is something that you're all very familiar with, but I'm going to show you how practically this translates into um, into the te uh, teaching learning of math in in my classroom. So, I'm just going to speak of Bloom's uh, sorry Maslow's needs hierarchy just from the perspective of learning math. So, we have at the lowest rung we have the physiological needs where st students have to just basically survive the math. Then there are the safety needs where you have to have emotional well-being. You have to have safe spaces for learning. Like um, I remember in one of my practice lessons, I went to a school and I and I told the children, uh, you know, we always have this thing, the same routine way of uh, people answering in the student participation is how many students can raise their hands. And students are often scared to raise their hand because they are, they are, they fear what if the answer is wrong. They, you know, they 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 could be everyone laughing at them. So that's say those safety needs have to be taken care of. There must be that emotional well-being, a safe space for learning. Then you have the love and belonging needs. So again, there is that uh, like uh, Anu Greenian would say there should be kindred spirits in the classroom. Then there are the esteem needs, and uh, there should be respect and acknowledgement from the teacher for the student at all times. And self-confidence and independence will then grow in the student. So this is this is a two-way street. The teacher shows respect and acknowledgement to the student, and then there's the, the growth of self, the nurturing of self-confidence and independence in the child. And the self-actualization needs, so once the esteem needs are met, then the student can actually discover his or her potential, can re refine their talents, develop their skills. Now if we look at Bloom's taxonomy. If you look at Bloom's taxonomy, we move from remembering. So I put the knowledge dimension on one, one side and I put the cognitive process on the other. So we move generally from factual to remember, then conceptual, which means understand the ability to understand and apply, then procedural, where you try to analyze, and then the metacognitive, where you evaluate and create. Now, my goal through the visible thinking routines is to reach that stage of meta, the metacognitive, where there is evaluation and creation. And all this will not happen without Vygotsky's influence or Vygotsky's direction, where he says all learning takes place within social settings. So there is social constructivism. The teacher must provide the scaffolding, like you saw in that in the video that we played on from what years ago. There was there was that scaffolding there that, that took care of the student. Then the teacher is the more knowledgeable other, and the teacher, through incremental improvement, will get the student to their zone of proximal development. Now, when we think of the teacher as the more knowledgeable other, as a teacher, you must go into your classroom with an asset-based approach. What is the meaning of an asset-based approach? You have to know that children are bringing something with them. You build on that. So these six points, if you can keep in mind, so social cultural structures impact individual experiences and opportunities. In Canada, we have a blend of different ethnicities, people uh, and um, 
students of different abilities. So what we, we look for in our education system or in our teaching practice is equity, not equality. And you can see the difference in that picture that I've put up there, where everybody has a fair chance of success. Then you must have high expectations for your students at all times, be affirming to them at all times. Um, you know, uh, I grew up with teachers who instilled fear in me. Perhaps in my initial days as a teacher, I might have been the same way too, but things are different now. You can't, you have to have you, uh, an affirmative um, stance at all times. Then see yourself as a change agent working towards equity. Understand that learners construct their own knowledge. Design and build the instruction based on students' prior knowledge. So stretch their thinking and learning. That's where that incremental improvement and the movement to the zone of proximal development comes in. And you must have a deep knowledge of your students, how they learn best. So there is no one size fits all. Okay, so I'm going to talk now about how the assessment process in our school or in my school particularly, traverses the cognitive process domain. So we have here, so what you can see over here is how marks are broken down. So you have, if the, the, the total weightage for the course is 100%, 70% of the marks are for ongoing learning tasks through the term. And the 30% is for the final summative assessment, which is uh, maybe 15% is a written exam and 15% is the independent study project or a culminating project, which, which, where, which is where I have focused more on the use of the visible thinking routines. And in math, when we do questions, the questions are based on these four categories. So you have knowledge, you have inquiry and thinking, communication and application. So knowledge is, do you have factual knowledge? Can you use a formula, apply, apply the formula? That's where your rote learning comes in. That's where the drill and mastery comes in. Then inquiry and thinking, can you think critically and creatively? Communication, can you communicate meaning? through how you write, through, through visuals, through graphs, whatever. And applications, can you make connections and uh, transfer your learning skills to a new setting? So a typical math exam would have questions from all these categories. And you can see the weightage for inquiry and application is more than knowledge and communication. So inquiry and application is, is weighted at 30% and knowledge and communication is weighted at 20%. So this is what a typical math test would look like. And you can see here, there are the different categories. So there's knowledge, thinking, communication, application, questions in each category. And you can see, uh, and of course the mark, marks will be put in accordingly, but when entering them into the report card, they will be multiplied by the weightage. So knowledge, whatever you get in knowledge was multiplied by 0.2, thinking by 0.3, like that. And that's how the marks are calculated. Now, this is where you would, if you look at uh, Bloom's taxonomy, the conceptual, understand, apply, procedural, all these, these, these uh, components are kind of taken care of in the math test. But if you want to go to the metacognitive where you want to evaluate and create, that's where I thought the visible thinking routines would come in handy. And for that, the students will have to do a math project generally. And one of the things that students can do, have to be provided with when you give them the, the task overview is you have to give them a detailed rubric. So a rubric will have the exact uh, descriptors of what you are looking for in their project work. And in that rubric, you will have to tell them exactly what are the marks that they hope that they can hope to achieve based on how much they have completed. So the rubric then becomes uh, a formative uh, uh, support to them while they are working, and then a summative evaluation tool for you while you are evaluating. And there is also that, um, what shall I say? You, know, the you can also speak to the students and you, you also, it also gives you the evidence to, to, to justify why a student has got the marks that they have got. Rubrics are important and they have to be very, very, precise, you cannot have a generic rubric for everything. So based on what your task is that you are asking the students to do, you will have to have a rubric that 
fits that particular task. And that's where teachers have to think and, uh, and work you know, towards making that explicit for the students so that they, the students and the people who collaborate with them and help them with their learning at home, whether it's their parents or their, their teachers, can work together. And there is some amount of transparency because again, this is not like a right and wrong thing where there is objective marking. It is, there is an element of subjectivity, but there is also an element of transparency and accountability. So if you see this rubric here, I'm not asking, uh, I don't expect you to read it. This is just a small snapshot of it, but here you have five criterion that are being evaluated. So there's presentation, math communication, personal engagement, reflection, and the use of math. These five criteria are the IB criteria. In my school, what we do is we offer a dual curriculum. So we have the provincial curriculum as well as the IB. And both have to be taught con concurrently. So what I have done is I have merged the expectations of the, the, the ministry or the, pro, the provincial expectations with the IB. And that's how I have created these categories and sections where each level of, so you see here in presentation, you have achievement level zero if there's no aim, no title stated, et cetera. And uh, maybe rubrics is a whole different thing by itself. And as you work on it, you get better at it. The focus today is not rubrics, but I'm just telling you that a rubric is essential if you are moving towards that uh, goal of getting students to evaluate or create some project of their own. All right, so now that's where the visible thinking routines come in. And uh, I would like to now share a small video with you from Project Zero on the visible thinking routines. What can we as educators do to help students become better you can't thinkers? See the video, no. One might assume that a good place to start is to teach. I will just get that done. What can we as educators to help students become better? Okay, you should be able to see the video now. Better thinkers. Yes. One might assume that a good place to start is to teach thinking skills, but is teaching skills enough? We often miss opportunities to use the skills we have simply by not noticing times when they might be useful. Good thinkers not only know how to think creatively, critically, and deeply, they actually do it. They have a repertoire of thinking moves to draw on, they're inclined to use them, and they're sensitive to the times when thinking would be helpful. In other words, they're in the habit of observing, analyzing, and questioning. So can we teach this? Researcher educators at Project Zero have been exploring this question for many years and think the answer is yes. The thinking routines they have developed as part of their research invite learners of any age to be close observers, to organize their ideas, to reason carefully, and to reflect on how they're making sense of things. These routines are flexible enough to be used to engage learners with any artifact, system, or concept, including their own thought processes. Thinking routines are simple structures, for example, a set of questions or a short sequence of steps that can be used alone or with a group. They are designed to be easy to remember, practical, and to invite a broad range of thinking moves. 
They are well suited to leverage the power of collaborative thinking and transfer easily to any context. You can use them without training or prior experience, figuring out how they work along with your students just by using them. Thinking routines help students go beyond the superficial, inviting them to dig deeper by making the complex accessible. Through practice, learners become sensitive to opportunities to use their thinking moves in the wild, helping them to develop habits of mind that will sustain their curiosity inside and outside the classroom. Given the broad range of thinking routines available, it might be tempting to try out as many routines as possible, but this approach can turn them into mere strategies, subverting a core aspect of their design that they get used over and over again. Choosing one core thinking routine, for instance, see, think, wonder, and trying it out in as many contexts as possible is more likely to reveal the ways thinking routines can support individuals in developing habits of thinking and groups in developing a culture of thinking together. Once you and your students get comfortable with the idea of using a routine for structuring your thinking, it's easier to branch out and find routines that fit well with the kind of thinking you'd like to invite. For instance, asking deep questions, making connections, coming up with explanations, challenging those explanations, and exploring alternative perspectives. Thinking routines might at first seem too simple, but it is their simplicity that makes them easy to remember and to use. Rather than simplifying ideas, thinking routines offer straightforward ways to sustain learners in their inquiry into complex problem spaces. While it does take time, using thinking routines in your classroom cultivates a community of thinkers with a culture of thinking, supporting learners in becoming intentional in their shared pursuit of deep understanding. gathered from the video that uh, the thinking routines are very, very simple, but they are a good practice to develop a culture of thinking. And that's what we want from our students, to remove the fear of math. They have to see math and everything around them. They have to see the applicability and the usability of math. And that is what uh, these thinking routines have done for me, as in, it was my experiment that I tried these out. I, 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 you know, I was, I'm doing a course in IBDP certification called from the University of Toronto. And they use um, thinking routines in all our evaluations. So I thought, why can't I use these in my classroom with my teaching of math? And that is what I tried to do. So this is where you can gather the thinking routines if you go to this site. Can you? Okay. So, Hello, ma'am. May I enter in between, ma'am? Yes. Ma'am, I'm from Indore, MSB Education Institute. And we are using these visible thinking routines from last year. And we are yes. finding drastically changed in our students. That's so wonderful. All the visible routines, peel the, peeling the fruit, making connections, seeping wonder. Uh, connect extend challenge almost all the routines we are using they are like around 70 routines are there yes yeah we all the teachers are working in our school on this that's so wonderful to know so uh, you know i've i've i just tried it for this one these last two years because of you know the, the changes that happened in our education system because of covid and um, i had to 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 move beyond what was um, what was the, on the surface, kind of like uh, if just, if learning was online, how do you how do you uh, how do you account for authentic assessment? How do you ensure that students are thinking? Because I don't know when we when we offer students tests online, what is how how do you take 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 care to see that integrity is not compromised? So these are, these are questions that bothered me. And so then I said, 
why can't I, the students were very happy when they didn't have exams, but then when they had to think and work on and create projects like this, initially I had, uh, I had the, I had to deal with the complaints, but later they understood and, and appreciated what, what it was all about. So you can see, um, I, I will just share the thinking routines page with you and then we will move on further. So if you can see this, this is the, these are the thinking routines. All right, and if you can click on each one of them, like say, click on the core thinking routines, you see so many over here, like uh, supposing we look at connect extend challenge, there is a particular resource over here, a resource link, which will actually give you a PDF of what are the questions that you can ask, when you can use this, how you can use it. And it is very, very simple. These are very simple questions, but they have the ability to create or, or start inquiry processes in the minds of the students, which then can, can have a deep impact on whatever they are learning. All right, let's go back to the presentation. Okay, so let's try one where we have a, a using visible thinking routines for teaching and here we have the see, think, wonder. So the questions are simple. What do you see? You give the students a problem, something, you say, what do you see? What do you think about that? What does it make you wonder? And I'm talking now from these thinking routines can be used across different age groups. I use them for grade 11. And though these questions seem very simple, look at this question here. This is a grade 11, this is a question from the grade 11 textbook, uh, Introduction to Functions. Students don't know anything about functions or even if they have learned it before, uh, they need some, some review and recap or, or, or revisiting of those concepts. So here is a question. Angus recorded the heights and shoe sizes of students in his class. What can you draw from this data? So what do you see? What do you think? What do you wonder? Perhaps you can just ask children to just write down what do they see from this data? What are they thinking? What are you wondering? I would have uh, started a Jamboard and got you to uh, interactively post your, your answers there. But just in the interest of time, we, we will skip that. But you can see over here, there are certain thoughts that will come to your mind. What do you see? And anybody wants to say, what do you see? Are there any responses coming or shall I continue? It's written, it is not a function. Yeah, you see, it's not a function, but uh, how do you get students to understand the difference between relations and functions? And uh, that's where the see, think and wonder comes in. Like if you see uh, a higher shoe size means um, a taller person, but that's not always the case. And as they explore further and they wonder about how come somebody with shoe size eight can have a, can have a height of 160 and shoe size eight can also have a height of 174. This is where you understand that perhaps it's not really a function, okay? And that's where they start to appreciate uh, and understand the, the, the connection that uh, math has with real life. Okay, now this is where, this is what I really enjoyed last year. This is uh, using visible thinking routines for assessment. Like I said, the students didn't have exams and we were very happy. And I wasn't letting them go with uh, doing nothing. So I said, you have to now conduct an investigative exploration. Take your whole textbook and choose anything and conduct an in investigative exploration. What do you have to do in that? You have to write me a report at the end. What do I need to see in that? I need to see the aim of your investigation, the rationale, the methodology that you're using, the calculations, the conclusions, reflections, and references. And then I set in place scaffolding procedures, which was they would have visible thinking conferences with me. These were the dates for it. Then they had the submission of their draft report, and then they had the final submission. So these were things that I set in place at the outset. I gave them the rubric. I showed them what was expected of them. And let's see how the visible, how this, uh, this played out. So just to begin with, we started before they could actually uh, start on their journey. And remember, I gave them marks for everything. So even when they, they came to the visible thinking conferences, there were marks for the way they, they, they engaged in the conference. 
So the, the visible, and that was explained in the rubric. Now, the visible thinking routines for assessment. So at the outset, they had this, we had, we tried to think, puzzle, explore. So they have already chosen something. What do you think you would, so the questions here was, were, what do you think you know about the topic you have chosen for your exploration? exploration? What questions or puzzles do you have? What does this to topic make you want to explore? So this was when in the in the very initial stages when they had decided, okay, maybe I can use uh, sinusoidal functions. Maybe I could study uh, the impact on plants in, 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 in the nurseries because in Canada we have four seasons. And uh, if you go to a nursery to buy plants, you find there are different flowering plants at different times of the, of, between spring and summer. So does, does sinusoidal functions have something to do with that? And this, they, they perhaps came with these questions. So this was the initial meeting. Then we then I had the visible thinking conferences with them as they worked on their project. So I've just put two posters over here of the visible thinking conference one and visible thinking conference three. And here you see the, the visible thinking conference that I had with them was connect extend challenge. So how is your investigative exploration connected to something you know about? What new ideas or impressions have extended your thinking in new directions? And what is challenging or confusing? What do you wonder about? And this is where when they come in with their challenges or their, 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 their doubts, that's where the teacher comes in to provide the direction that they need. And here there was a visible thinking conference three and you can see the, 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 the sentence prompts are, I used to think, now I think. And you see this picture over here. There's this one guy, he's painting what he can see and he can only see the bars. And the other guy can see beyond the, the iron bars and he can see the, the, the beauty in outside the prison cell. So sometimes when students are, are presented with a task, they might feel that they are in a prison cell and there are so many constraints and, and constrictions around them. But as they begin to think better and they understand what they are doing in this exploration, the picture changes. And I'm going to share, share with you some projects that the students did. So this is one particular project uh, where a student wanted to mathematically model the population growth in her city. So she went into um, Statistics Canada and got, gathered data on the population. I cannot share the whole project, so I've just put pictures of certain aspects of the projects. And here are her answers to the Visible Thinking Conference. The first one was Connect. How So Connect Extend Challenge. She says, how is your investigative exploration connected to something you know about? I was initially going to do something related to biology and organisms, but I decided to redirect my focus towards population growth, as I recently heard a new story about Canada accepting more immigrants. While immigrants are good for the economy and the country, I wanted to see how it would impact my city, which is already facing consequences due to overpopulation. So you see, she's already making a connection. She's trying to fit her knowledge of math into the world that she lives in. And then that makes it... Uh, engaging that makes it um, interesting she sees some responsibility in her learning then extend what new ideas or impressions have extended she says i'm excited to see if i can model the growth of population and see if the growth is sustainable i also want to see how i can use logarithmic and exponential functions i learned in class for modeling so now the math is coming in. and the challenge what is the challenge my biggest challenge is i'm not sure entirely sure what equations or rules to use accurately to do my investigation. I'm not even sure if my investigation is feasible, but hopefully it should be within the scope of the math. And then at the end, when she had almost completed a visible thinking conference says, I used to think, and now I think, I was always worried that I was going to struggle with the math part and this exploration would be too difficult. Now I think I actually enjoyed the math because it was like solving a puzzle. It helped me to learn a lot more. It wasn't as difficult as I initially thought it would be, but it did take me a while to understand how to go about it. This is another ex example. This is a student who said she wants to explore how math can be used in forensic science. And I told her nothing about this. She created this scene herself. So she created a fictional case study. This is a, a picture from her report. So she's written over here on November 11, the victim, a 17-year-old Swiss female was, was seen by multiple witnesses to be enjoying her 17th birthday party at her house. And what she's tried to do is she's tried to create a case study where she's using uh, logarithms and Newton's laws of cooling to explain 
to to kind of um, suggest who could have been the uh, the murderer based on the time at which they were last seen with the victim and and the um, the the temperature change in the body so she used a, some physics she used some math but it was entire and she she also used her her uh, interest in in crime documentaries etc to bring that into her project and this was what she wrote about in her visible thinking conference my investigative exploration is connected to various aspects of my knowledge the topic of my exploration also relates to my passion for watching investigations and crime documentaries some new ideas i will extend my thinking and add complexity to the papers including some understanding of physics i think this type of explanation will tie math and its application with regards to the topic and make the paper flow better what is challenging is putting i have a challenge i have is putting on the shoes of a scientist that will help me where uh, you know with these investigations i think communicating the relation between my topic problem and the math while making sure all of the requirements are met is a challenge and what did she say at the end i'm just going to read the last paragraph she says i thought that the concepts in maths had very specific few real applications in the real world such as logarithmic and exponential functions exclusively being applied to population growth though i knew there were other applications of these mathematical concepts my approach would usually include only the more popular or common applications however writing this paper has taught me to accommodate unconventional applications of this mathematical topic while dealing with them so this this student really surprised me she surpassed the expectations i had for her and perhaps she surpassed the expectations for herself too this was another another uh, example of student work this uh, student tried to uh, she uh, what she tried to do was she used um, my hypothesis is to infer the what equipment uh, so she's trying to investigate a case where a child went missing in an amusement park and she is going to use uh, radian measures and the angles to calculate the amount of time the child spent on each uh, um, each ride in the park and then uh, you know use some kind of math technique to find out when the child might have gone missing so i appreciated the 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 thought processes of these students the the, the directions in which they 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 challenged themselves the reports that they, they that they drew out at the end of it were fascinating like this particular uh, this particular student whose project i showed you just now this student was an international student this student did not have um you know proficiency in language but there is still that ability to communicate to write up a report and to present something that they initially thought was maybe they came from a culture where it was all about just learning math by knowing the formula being applied be able to apply the formula to solve the sum correctly but here it was something more and and she was able to do it okay so another thing in canada is like we have to focus on growing success which means um, students marks must not be affected by something that you know that one particular day things just didn't go well and you, and you didn't do well that should not be a reflection of of what you are your marks must show your most consistent most recent um, progress so one of the things that we do over there is we have a, a close network with parents and we use the parents as collaborators in the learning journey of the, of the students even though these are grade 11 and 12 students so i thought of having a visible uh, uh, using the visible thinking routine for a student led conference now this is compass points so compass points talks about uh, east west north south so e is for excited what 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 excites you about your progress in this course what the upside worrisome what do you find worrisome about your performance in the term what's the downside so if students can write this down then you can have a conversation with them and uh, keep that in mind when you when you're interacting with them that this is where the student needs help this is where the student needs a little nudge a little encouragement a little clarification and that would help then what do you need to know what support can you from your teacher or parents can help you do better what are your suggestions for moving forward what are your long term goals what are your short term goals this can be filled out by the student again the use of a visible thinking routine for a student portfolio then when you come to meeting with the parents like you have all the 
the, the assessments that parents can also have access to. So you could talk to the, the, this is another visible thinking routine lenses for dialogue. So I could say to the parents, what observations do you have on your child's progress? So this is C, probe, uh, choose and share a lens and reflect. So what observations do you have on your child's progress? Is there any particular piece of assessed work you would like to discuss? Just one piece. Uh, tell me more about what you see in this work that concerns you. And reflect, um, you, you give your perspective as the teacher. And then after our conversation, do you have any new thoughts? So that's the reflection part. I can make a note here and keep that in the student portfolio in my record so that I know how the student is progressing as she moves forward. Okay, so that was student using the visible thinking portfolio uh, routines for student portfolios. So in conclusion, I would say that using the visible thinking routines have helped me develop uh, or, or nurture the IB approaches to learning skills among my students. As you can see, they did their research. They were able to communicate. They were able to write down their reports. They were able to think. They gave me projects which I never imagined they would have done. There was self-management. They were able to stick to the deadlines. They were able to work and produce the, 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 the project report in a, in, a, in a manner that was expected of them. They, they, they developed social skills because whenever we met for the visible thinking conferences, we met in small groups. So they learned from each other. They learned to support each other. They learned to listen to each other. And they learned how math is related to life. And math is not something that is... Uh, isolated from life. So when students surpassed their expectations, these were some of the responses I got from them <coughs> and so far as the course evaluation is concerned. So somebody said, I just, I think I just needed motivation to improve and math. when math becomes fun, it becomes easier. Another student said, thanks for a precarious year. And he put his name there, that's why his name is there. This was a fun and rather nice course. I learned a lot. Thank you for the enjoyable two years. And another student said, overall, I did enjoy this course and it was wonderful. So basically what you see here is when students begin to enjoy, they begin to learn. And that was perhaps how the visible thinking routines helped me. Okay, any questions? Before we go to the questions, we could use uh, the compass points that is the thinking routine to discuss questions. But I just want to conclude with this thought from the, from the IB documents. And it says, the implementation of process-oriented skill-based teaching can be challenging for both teachers and students. <coughs> Excuse me. The teacher's role becomes more facilitative and the student's role more inquiring. These approaches to teaching and learning do, however, have the potential to develop minds well-formed rather than minds well-stuffed. And that is an aspiration at the heart of IB education. This is from the IB document, but I think this should be an aspiration at the heart of every teacher, whether you're teaching math or anything. You want minds that are well-formed rather than minds that are well-stuffed. Okay, thank you for joining me in this exploration. If you have any questions now, we could discuss them using a visible thinking routine. So I would request participants to uh, unmute themselves and ask any questions. We have a couple of questions on the YouTube also, which uh, students can put across. Uh, I'll read one of the questions from YouTube. Uh, the question is, ma'am, could you please show us how to use the website more effectively? Which website? Are you talking about the thinking routines website? Uh, please reply in the YouTube comments, whoever has asked the question. 
Meanwhile, there is another question: Can we get wide variety of visible thinking routine ideas through links? Yeah. So if you go to the uh, let me stop share and I'll show you the visible thinking routine uh, page. Okay. Can you see this? Uh, see see this page that I'm sharing with you. It says connect extend challenge. Can you see that? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Okay. So here you have connect extend challenge, and if I go back, uh, if you go to this site that is uh, let me let me go to it from the um, from the presentation. So here you can see the 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 project zeros thinking to thinking routine toolbox, and there are so many different thinking types over here. So you have the core thinking routines, you have perspectives, controversies, dilemmas, you have perspective taking, whatever. So supposing you click on core thinking routines, and these are so many over here. So let's say supposing I I said I I used C think wonder. So I'll click on this. And when you click on this, you come to here where you see resource links, click here, and you have a PDF that you can download for free. And it shows you what is the, it says, what is the purpose? What kind of thinking does this routine encourage? This routine encourages students to make careful observations and thoughtful interpretations. It helps stimulate curiosity and sets the stage for inquiry. When and where can I use it? So these are, there is, there is a, a kind of like a note on how you can use this. Sometimes you must challenge yourself and try and use it in a different way. Like when I when I used it for um, for for the student portfolio, when I the thing that I said about lenses, it was um, it was actually meant for uh, looking through uh, an art gallery. But don't you think student, student work is some kind of reflection of their art or their craft? And so I said, why can't I use that over there? So it's uh, as you start using it, you will start enjoying it and you will start appreciating it. And your, your, mind, your mind will start making connections where you can see a new way in which you can use this particular thinking routine. Uh, there was a teacher who shared her experience and she can add to this, uh, this conversation just now and tell us how they, they use it in their school too. The important thing is that we have to move away from, you know, just the objective kind of, or just the routine way of uh, assessing students. We have to move towards deeper thought processes where they understand the context in which they are learning. Rosel, can you uh, put the link on the chat? Of, of the, the uh, yeah. Yeah. Can I read the next question? Yeah. Uh, the question is, what is the teacher-student ratio in Canada? That could differ. It depends on, uh, I know where this question is heading. The, the next uh, thing will be, we have bigger class sizes in India, so how do we work that out? Um, honestly, I would say that um, doing this kind of thing is always hard work, where you have to move beyond uh, asking um, move beyond what is uh, just, uh, you know, the, the normal uh, paper pencil test. It is always harder because then you're, you are having to invest yourself in understanding if there, were, if there were 30 students in my class, 30 different projects, and also understand where the student lie, or where the student is on their own growth journey or, the, or on their own uh, 
proficiency level in math. Uh, the next question is, how is competency-based education in India different from Canadian one? Uh, I don't understand uh, these buzz terms of competency-based education. What do you mean by competency-based education? Should I move on to the next question? If anybody knows uh, what is the, what what is your understanding of competency, uh, applying it to day to day life, so what is different then? We're trying to do the same thing. Ma'am, right? I guess it is the skill to uh, the skills we use to teach. Yeah, but uh, what is different? We were doing the same thing. We 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 only uh, the 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 language is different. That's it. But the the goal is almost the same. Along with the subjects, uh, skills are also assessed, ma'am, in competency-based learning. What, what didn't you see math skills at uh, math skills on display over here in the in the projects that they that they presented? Yes, ma'am. Numeracy skill, computational errors, logical exactly. problem correct, solving. Correct, correct, correct. So it's just that you don't put those uh, those. Uh, categorical names, you look at it from a holistic perspective, but the, uh, the ultimate goal is really the same. Are there any more questions? Any more questions? Yeah, uh, yes. Uh, how can we use thinking routine in our lessons? Or is it only for uh, project purpose? You can use thinking routines in anything. Like that's why I said, uh, you know, to evaluate the webinar, let's uh, let's use a thinking routine. So what excited you about this webinar? What was worrisome for you? Can I do this in my classroom? Can I do this kind of thing? Am I, are there systems in place? Will, will, will management accept if I if I had a rubric and said, ask students to do a project, how will parents have perceive it? So these, these are questions like what, worrisome. What do you need to know more? Maybe you need to understand how to write rubrics, how to how to evaluate and assess rubrics. What is your stance? What is the what is the the stand the the, the contention that you will have now moving forward with respect to teaching of math? So this was where I was I was looking at uh, evaluating, uh, gathering your thoughts based on a thinking routine, and that is why I put that last slide where we had the the compass points thinking routine. So as you start using the thinking routines. Just go onto that site, go to that page, play with it, look at the different uh, you know, options that are there. Try and start thinking yourself. When you start thinking as a teacher, you, you, will, you will be amazed at what you will get from your students. I remember when I was a teacher educator, I used to always tell the students about, uh, uh, you know, in, in Canada, we have the Niagara Falls and there was this one person who thought about the power and energy that could come through the falls. And uh, he created um, a power generator there, which then provides uh, electricity to 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 to, to so many parts of the of the of the region. Think of the energy and think of what you're dealing with as teachers. What do you have in your classroom? You have more than the Niagara Falls, the minds of the students. If you can be able to tap even into a little of that, you would be doing a great service to yourself. Ma'am, a question from YouTube. How do we know the evaluation is foolproof guarantee of their learning? So uh, one thing that we do in Canada is we don't have only assessment of product. We have conversation on and observation also. Like in, in, in most uh, systems, we would have just the assessment of your, um, your test, right? That is product or your assignment that you submit, but you also have a, a conversation observation. So that is an ongoing assessment and we have to develop assessment plans that give appropriate weightage to these aspects also. 
that's when you know whether the student is really doing it or, or faking it, right? And as you become uh, more and more adept at, at teaching, you know very well when, when there has been a compromise on integrity. And you know how much you want to intervene in that situation and where you want to uh, you know, put the brakes. That's your professional judgment. Coming back to the previous question about the websites, about how to use them effectively, the website you shared in your PPT. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I did say that you go into the website, look, click on any of the routines, and think about how this routine could be applied to something that I want to, that I, that I, that I'm doing. You know, don't only think about think about it in terms of math. Think about it in terms of um, a task that you're doing at home. How can, I, how can I use this particular thinking routine? And when you're able to use that thinking routine, you start thinking. When you start thinking, you trans transfer that skill to your classroom, you transfer that skill to your students. That, you know, a, a deep concern for me is that we should have teachers who can think, think independently and think creatively, think critically. In terms of bettering things, the situation that you are, not in terms of like uh, finding what's wrong with the system. You have the system as it is, you improve on that. That's where the incremental improvement and um, what should I say, My zone of proximal development. You, you get yourself to your zone of proximal development and it will, it will show um, great returns in your in your students yeah teaching math is teaching thinking of course uh one more question can it be applied to students in lower classes yes that again it, it, it's it's so effective with students in lower classes you see some of those thinking routines are very very effective with students in in lower classes like say the, we took that see think wonder you will have students in, especially in lower classes, like uh, uh, I remember this uh, quote by Mark Twain. I think he said, I was born brilliant, education ruined me. Children in lower classes ask you more intelligent questions because they have not been conditioned by the system. So getting them to think at that age is wonderful. Any more? Susan, any more questions? Uh, Ma'am, there's a question about what is what is this class about? I'm sorry. There's a request to share some books uh, which teachers can refer. Honestly, just look at the, the website. Look at the website and try the thinking routines. You don't need any other books. Then take the thinking routine to your classroom. Perhaps one of the exercises that you can do in your teachers in your teachers training program is try incorporating the thinking routines into your lessons, into your lesson plans, so that you get the practice of using the thinking routines. Uh, one more question. What are remedial solutions for students performing below par in Canada? All right. <clears throat> like I said in, in one of the slides you might have seen, <clears throat> I spoke about equity and not equality. So what, what we can offer students is um, opportunities for improvement. And that's uh, uh, one thing that I appreciate about the, the system here is that each teacher has a certain level of autonomy. Uh, in India, when I taught in school, it was like we had unit tests, we had exams, semester exams. And uh, these were the only marks that, that, uh, that were reflected in the student report. That's not the case here. It, the 70% of ongoing assessment is for all the assessments that happen through the year. And I, as a teacher, like 
if I teach a course and there are eight chapters in the course, I like to follow the traditional chapter method. Some teachers may just take se several chapters together as a unit and have a test on one unit. But uh, we, we have certain things like um, assessments. They are, like I told you, they have to be assessments uh, of product, observation, conversation, and you must have assessments as for as an off learning. So assessments for learning would be uh, like when you do your lesson plans, what do you say? What is the previous knowledge of the student? You perhaps ask them some questions or you have a small little quiz or an activity for them to do. That's your assessment for learning. Assessment as learning is where you keep asking questions. You keep, you give them a test or you give them, you give them an exit ticket, something like that while you are teaching. An assessment of learning is what happens at the end. So in your assessment plan, you're supposed to account, you're supposed to have at least for every off learning, off learning is what marks will see, you will see in the report. There must be at least two assessments for and two assessments as learning. So that's where you know that this child is not understanding something, perhaps we need to provide them with some accommodations. In some cases, students also have an individualized education plan where their tests may be chunked. What is the meaning of chunking? You do only part of the test on one day, you do part of a test on another. Now here you have to, as the teacher, you have to be careful about how you take care that there is, there is a certain level of integrity maintained in the test that you're offering them. And uh, for my part, what I do is I give the students three chances. At the end of the year, they have three chances to improve on their, on their work. So if they do their, if there is a particular test that they haven't done well on and if they want to do the corrections, I'll say, okay, you do the corrections, I'll give you 50% of the deficit. So means, which means if there was a knowledge question and the knowledge questions were out of 16, they got eight. They did it again and they got all correct. I'll give them only 50% of the deficit, which means four, four marks more. And uh, sometimes I would just give them an opportunity to do the thinking and application questions again, but give them different questions because those, uh, those categories of questions are weighted higher. Or I would give them an opportunity to take one retest in the whole course where then the marks are what they get. So because they know that they have these opportunities for improvement along the way, and you are a teacher who wants to know how much they know, not how much they don't know, it, uh, it helps them and they, they, want to, they want to live up to your expectations. They want to live up to the, the faith that you repose on them. Somebody asked if we are students select their own case study. Yes, they, in, in this case, they selected their own case study. I have no more questions. Thank you. All right, thank you. I think it was a wonderful session um, with Roselle. I think this evening was very fruitful for us. Uh, knowing about uh, these uh, thinking tools, and definitely, I think uh, with the uh, with the with your session, we are motivated enough to implement th this. At least look at it and try to understand it also further. Uh, so uh, I would really thank you. And uh, uh, we have our manager here, Father. Would you like to say something? I, we can't hear you. You're muted. Rosel, I suppose you can hear me now. Yes, yes. Yes. I always connected uh, math with, uh, in a way, logical thinking. And I, I realized that math implied a certain amount of logical thinking. Do I... Uh, it was late in my, I mean, and not so much in my school career, but when I was in college, that I, when I learned logic, that I realized that math and logic are very closely related. You need to think logically and critically for math to play a, a living role in your life. And this became real for me only when I had to be out in the villages and try to understand how village children and how village adults uh, think maths. Perhaps they don't think it, of it in the same way as we do in uh, urban areas where maths is taught to us in a very uh, systematic manner uh, in school. But 
they have to think maths. They mean, if you see that uh, the way they make their houses, I would used to wonder how they can be so precise with regard to their uh, angles and things that they use to make their houses. I said, this cannot happen unless they are thinking mathematically and logically. And often, uh, I they would do a better job of the of using their mathematical, natural mathematical uh, uh, ability to do things correctly, to measure their fields correctly, to measure the water in the <laughs> wells correctly. So I would I used to wonder these people have not gone to school, uh, and perhaps their mathematical thinking is not as sophisticated as it is when you uh, enter school, but. It is the mathematics that is related to life. And I think that is important for us all uh, to see how mathematics is related to our life. If there, is no, if there is no relationship between the mathematics that we learn in school and our life out there, uh, it, it is uh, something that remains very, very abstract in the mind. And it, I think uh, we need to be able to link it to life, yes. to link mathematics to life, to link geometry to life, to link algebra to life. Often perhaps algebra is the most difficult to link to life. Arithmetic and geometry are easier, but the others uh, are the more difficult. And yet they are used. They are used by people in their processes of calculation, in their processes of uh, measuring things and all. And perhaps they will not be able to explain it to you because you have uh, work, uh, vocalized it, alphabetized it, and numerically you have described it, which they might not be able to do. But it is a facility which I have seen that villagers and even village children uh, use very, very well. I'm saying, and yet uh, we always think that mathematics is a difficult subject. If you ask the, these, them to do something, they would do it absolutely correctly. Because if we, But in the class, if you told them now you have to learn these formula and not this formula didn't make much sense to them. So my concern more is how do I link mathematics with life so that it becomes something relevant to the lives of students, to the lives of people? That is a question. And often I thought you have to discover while you may know the basics of mathematics, you have to discover the methodology that will relate and vibrate with people out there so that they say, I, I understand it. I know what it is. It, I, this is what I have done, but I didn't know how to describe it. No? Okay. Yeah. So that's what I think is uh, essential for us, to relate it to life, to relate it to logical thinking. And uh, that was uh, that was uh, that was um, uh, an endeavor that I sought to to work towards. Like when the students had to develop their projects, I did not tell them you develop your project in this particular area or that particular area. I said go into your world and see what what where, where you can see math around you. Like I told you, one one particular student, he um, he calculated the hours of daylight and how that impacts plants in a particular season. And he used sinusoidal functions there. So now you're using geomet geometry, you're using trigonometry, and you're understanding that even the business of running a nursery uses trigonometry, uses yes. uh, math. Yes. And uh, that's when they, they begin to, to appreciate and enjoy what they are doing. Yes. And then he decided, okay, these are the plants I'm going to get for my garden now. And uh, that became a, a, a kind of like a, an in, a fun activity out of the math project. Yes. Yeah. So I was amazed at what the students gave me. Um, one, one particular student, she did a, a study on the well-being of students during the lockdown. So she created her own um, questionnaire. She circulated it among her, her peers and she used statistics to, to present a report on what, uh, what were the concerns and, and uh, difficulties of, and challenges of the students during the lockdown. So that was amazing. Very nice. Yeah. One of the areas in which I saw uh, people uh, develop an innate uh, relationship was in the watershed work 
that I was involved in in the rural areas. Watershed work implies a lot of uh, exactitude with regard to slope, with regard to terracing. And uh, they develop a, a sense of exactly what the slope has to be, what the terracing has to be, what the buns have to be, where the gully plug should come. Mm -hmm. So I think the more we relate it to life, the more uh, uh, living it becomes. <laughs> the more valuable it becomes and uh, the more enjoyable it becomes and students can uh, can th that fear of math then goes away because you know that you're living math it's not something that is isolated from what you another thing that we do in Canada is we don't uh, like I remember in India we had to learn formula by heart your students are allowed a cheat sheet if you need to know the formula it's all there and if you need to use a calculator it's there so that's not where you're using your intelligence your intelligence comes where you're being able to apply what you have learned Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, I now request uh, Rachel to give us a few instructions on the feedback form. Rachel? Yes, ma'am. So, a general reminder to all the participants present here link for the feedback form will be sent in the chat box as well as uh, on the, in the chat on the YouTube shortly by the end of the session. Kindly fill it to get the e certificates. I now request Sarang to deliver the vote of thanks. Yes, ma'am. So good evening to one and all. It gives me an immense pleasure to propose a vote of thanks on behalf of SXI to all the dignitaries present here. Today, we were able to reflect upon many things, including Howard's visible thinking tools, which will for sure incorporate many learning and evolution teaching skills in mathematics. A special thanks to a resource person, Dr. Rosel D'Souza, who has shown a presence from all the way from Canada. Your expertise tactics for sure will boost mathematics learning in all numerous ways, ma'am. Thank you. Right from the agendas of learning mathematics to how to tackle the phobia of mathematics and from the various theories like the Bloom's and the Maslow's and the assessment process. It was all very inspiring, ma'am. Uh, it, felt, it felt very real. Also, uh, I think by practicing the uh, virtual thinking, I think it will be good for us to be more creative and be better thinkers when it comes to maths in all the possible ways, ma'am. Also, thank you, ma'am, once again for your precious time and all the sharing your, with your vast knowledge with us. Now, I, I would like to thank our manager, Father Blaise D'Souza, for sharing our unique ideas and experience toward mathematics. Also, I would like to thank our principal, Sosama Samuel, for sharing your inspiring insights on visible thinking. Also, genuine thanks to our staff coordinator, Dr. Vini Sebastian, for giving me this opportunity and for all the countless efforts, coordination, which helped us to make the event a success. Also, the, the session wouldn't be successful without our organizing team, Blit, Numel, Olisa, Susan, Saloni, Rachel, Nilsima, who all supported us from being behind the curtains and making this webinar flourishing. At last, I would like to appreciate all the participants for actively engaging through Zoom and YouTube during this session and being such a genuine sport. Without you, the session wouldn't feel alive. Looking forward to see you all again. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. <coughs> Thank you, Roselle. Thank you lot. again. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Bye. So it is, it's morning for Roselle, early morning for Roselle. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much, Charles. Thank That's you, Roselle. Bye. Thank you, Father Bye. Bye, Bye everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Uh, uh, Rachel, Rachel, are you there? Yes, ma'am. I'm there. Uh, I'm not able to, I'm putting it on the YouTube, but it is not getting a uh, hyperlink. I'm sure I put it. Uh, put no put. Yes, ma'am.
it's not appearing there on the youtube huh? ma'am if it is not getting hyperlink we can put it on whatsapp no yeah yeah put it then yes blith you put it okay ma'am i'll do that Okay, students. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Bye, ma'am. Shall thank we leave? Thank you, ma'am. Bye. Yes, yes. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, ma thank you, ma'am. Ma'am, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Ma thank, ma thank, ma thank you. It was a very nice session. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am.